All right, so in this module, we're gonna talk about the crystals that polymers form. And let's start with the general pop properties that we get from crystalline polymers. So the, the first thing that, that sometimes comes up is that when we're making a polymer part um, and casting it, there can actually be a fair amount of shrinkage of the part uh, once it's cooled because there's such a change in volume like you saw in those early curves. So this is something that has to be accounted for um, in the processing of polymers because they can change or shrink quite a bit. And so you have to compensate for that. So this over here is clay, but the same idea holds for polymers. Um, however, you do get increased strength and stiffness. And so those materials are generally um, uh, have good increases in strength and stiffness. However, uh, you can get more brittle uh, behavior in these polymers. Um, so that's obviously not <laughs> what, what we typically want. So these crystalline polymers um, are composed of crystals, right? And so this is just like we talked about with metals um, and ceramics. There's an ordered arrangement However, instead of atoms or ions, they're ordered arrangements, excuse me, of the chains or one chain or multiple chains. And so this kind of shows you the unit cell um, of uh, polyethylene. So you kind of see the box here and instead of an atom or an ion, you see that it's a portion of the chain, right? So we have a portion of the molecule itself. And so that's what separates polymer crystals from metal and ceramic crystals, is that instead of those discrete molecules or atoms, we have uh, discrete portions of the molecule, uh, molecular chain. And so that's the difference. And so they tend to be rather complex crystal structures. And so we won't necessarily talk a lot about the specifics of the those unit cells. Uh, more, uh, we'll talk about the general characteristics of crystalline polymers. All right, so to, do, to get into that crystal structure, what we see is that the um, chains have to kind of fold over on themselves. And so it's this chain folding structure that we talk about. And so if we wanna form that structure, so the unit cell or the, the uh, crystalline region is the gray area, the gray box that you see on the screen. Uh, and you see it's formed by a chain polymer going into a certain position and then you see this little loop region where it folds back over on itself and then you see another region in a highly specific portion right so there's chain here 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 so it's very highly ordered however there's these loops on the end that don't necessarily contribute to the crystalline structure and so this is kind of the foundation for how we get a heavily crystalline region, but then also the folded regions on the ends um, do not belong to that crystalline structure. And so like I said, uh, most polymers have crystalline and amorphous regions. And so this is kind of like a microstructure that you might see where you see this is heavily uh, crystalline region where you have that chain folding, but there's also like a little uh, surrounding it, there's also amorphous regions. Uh, maybe it could be the chains that are involved in that that don't fully crystallize and, and so forth. So we have crystalline regions, you can see the heavily ordered uh, linear, uh, you know, the, the planes here, uh, but then you also have other regions like this where the chains are not. Because again, it's it, Polymers are rarely 100% crystalline. It's difficult for all regions of all the chains to become aligned. And so we're left with this two-phase material. And we want to describe that crystallinity with the percent, right? So how much is amorphous? How much is crystalline? And that's what this kind of number is. And we'll talk about how we get to, uh, to that. But we can always um, adjust or we can use heat treatments to affect the amount of crystallinity. Uh, to sort of favor crystalline growth. And so there's things that we can do to adjust that number for a particular material. And like I said, those fully crystalline polymers are, are basically rare and only made in the lab, but here's an example of one. So this is a, 
electron micrograph, so electron image, and uh, it's basically a single crystal of polyethylene uh, grown uh, as a single crystal, but again, it, it has to be grown really carefully and so forth, but it's done from the, the chain folding model, and you can see kind of different layers of the, uh, the crystalline polymer. But for us, semi-crystalline uh, polymers tend to have uh, a different structure, and that's known as spherulites. Um, and that's where we have sort of a, a general nucleation point where we have a crystalline region. And from there, you get these sort of uh, branches that grow off of that central nucleation point. So you'll get a crystalline region that forms here, one that forms here, and it actually can branch off again. And then uh, the regions in between these various branches tend to have those kind of folded regions, the amorphous ends that didn't do anything. And so those that's how uh, most semi-crystalline polymers are. They form this ferrolite structure, which means that we have kind of um, this branched off structure. And so if you view these, they tend to be more spherical like this down here, and they kind of look like dandelions because you'll have um, branches that are crystalline and then non-crystalline amorphous regions in between those branches. And those tend to grow, those branches tend to grow uh, until they reach another spherulite. And so that's why you tend to get roughly uh, a spherical formation, and so hence the name spherulite. So it's alternating layers between crystalline and amorphous regions, which is what you see here. Uh, and they can grow relatively quickly. All right, so this is actually uh, one that we did in the lab. So this is um, just an optical micrograph. Um, you can see here the kind of end result, which is those spherulites. And you might even be able to see kind of regions that are crystalline and amorphous. Um, and this was done with an ultra high molecular weight polyethylene. Um, and so if I play the video, we actually took a video of it growing, if it'll play. Ah, no, it will not. Okay, so I'll work on this video, and so I'll, I'll try to get this up um, onto YouTube for you to view as well, but it's basically just a video of these sphere lights growing um, uh, during an experiment we did in the lab. So apologize for that, but I'll, I'll put that up sometime. Okay, uh, here's a, a more detailed electron micrograph um, of a sphere light, and it's forming in natural rubber. So you can see that it doesn't, uh, it's not uh, as much dependent on the material as much as it's just a semi-crystalline polymer. So natural rubber can do this, polyethylene and so forth uh, can do this. But you can see the kind of general shape where it's nucleating the middle and it grows out in these branches. So it ends up kind of looking like dandelions to me. Um, and the way we typically think about these semi-crystalline polymers with the spherulite um, formation is we can think of them as two-phase materials when we want to look at the crystallinity. And so for crystalline polymers, the overall crystallinity can range from a give, uh, uh, different numbers. So for PET, uh, it can be as low as 30%, uh, and then for polyethylene, it can be as high as 90%. And again, the rest of it would be amorphous, so it doesn't have that long range um, order. And so we can view all semicrystalline polymers in this way as a two phase material where these uh, two phases are kind of interconnected because of the chains, uh, but they form into either long range order or no long range order. All right, and this is just kind of showing you how they grow. And again, I'm going to put up that video, but basically they nucleate from that center point and then they grow out um, until they've consumed um, the, uh, the raw material and they've kind of impinged on each other. And so you t tend to see that they're roughly spherical in nature. And this is done uh, from nucleation of that center point and then growth of the uh, amorphous and crystalline regions going out from that. And so that's kind of the main uh, method that we see 
and this is again kind of as you've seen a couple times now the structure of it afterwards uh, is basically those spherulites being um, growing until they encounter another and so they can end up in some different shapes um, if they are restricted by others okay. so because of this sort of nucleation and growth model um, it and, and we'll talk more about this uh, nucleation and growth um, in a later chapter. But because of this, uh, crystallization occurs between the two temperatures that we've talked about. So it can't occur above TM, right? It's got to be below or at TM. Uh, but it can't occur below TG because that's when those chains are frozen. So it's got to be above the point where chains are frozen and below the point where uh, solid forms. And so those are the kind of two factors, um, or two temperatures, and there's two factors that involve or in, uh, affect the rate at which crystallization occurs. So the first is kind of the driving force for crystallization. And so this is always going to favor the lower temperatures because the further away from the melting temperature, the more driving force there will be because it should already be a, you know, a solid, right? So the, uh, it's very unstable, uh, so to speak. However, the other factor here is the mobility, right? So if you need something to rearrange into crystalline structure, you need chains to be able to be mobile and to move. And so mobility is always going to increase with increasing temperature. So these factors kind of compete against each other, and therefore we have a trade-off. And so what we see, the important part of this, is that because of this, um, we see that the rate of crystallinity is actually a compromise, and it's actually maximum in the, ma in the intermediate temperature. And the way we can think of that is because at the very low temperatures, we have a really high driving force, but the mobility is very low. And so that mobility being very low would impede and be the kind of the rate limiting factor. And so the rate's really low. And then at the high end, the mobility is really good, but the driving force is really bad uh, because we're really close to TM. And so that driving force basically dominates because it's low. Uh, so it doesn't matter that the mobility is high. And so in between, we have intermediate mobility and intermediate driving force. And so that is where we have the maximum rate. And so this is kind of a compromise of these two factors. And so that's where we see. So when we look at crystallinity and where for things form um, the fastest, we're going to look in between these two temperatures. So that's important for the percent crystallinity as well, because if we want to try to increase the percent crystallinity, then we'd obviously try to uh, form in this middle region that we see here.